Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning, afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our seventh international webinar on strategies for success, tips and tricks for elevating your research papers. The webinar is organized by the IAM group of researchers, and I'm Niksha Zara, your host for today's sessions coming to you live from University of Agriculture, Festabad. Today, we have the distinct honor of welcoming our renowned expert in the field of global health design innovation and academic career mentor, Professor Amanu Seklevs, who is currently serving as a full professor and the co-director of the Future Cities Research Institute, a collaborative effort between Sunway Universities in Malaysia and Langster University, focusing on research in sustainable, resilient, livable, and digital cities. Driven by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Professor Seklev's research spans the intersection of health, sustainability, design, and technology with a keen focus on addressing global health challenges. His remarkable achievements include securing over 7 million euro in research funding as a principal investigator and co-investigator, along with playing pivotal roles in the project worth 11 euro million furthermore, Professor Seklevs has made significant contributions to academia through his ex extensive publication record, which includes over 100 international research articles and notable book publications. Amanos Professor's research has attracted the press, media attention with articles in the Daily Mail, Daily Mirror, The Times, The Scurry News Online, The Guardian, The Daily Telegraph, The Independent, Sky News, World Economic Forum, Medical News, and The Conversation, and several others, reaching over 30 million people. Moreover, the respected professor is recognized for his dedications to mentoring early career researchers, providing the invaluable guidance to navigate the academic career ladder. His commitment to fostering academic excellence and career development has left an indelible mark on the academic community. He has spent last decade and a half building a successful academic career, going from PhD graduate to full professor. Think the have a guiding light that helps them on the journey. I would like to invite the professor Emmanuel Seklos to join us to share his insights on writing research papers and abstracts, including strategies, tips, common mistakes to avoid and available free resources. Dear Professor, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank uh, you so much. I yes, will try to, sh to share my screen. Um, uh, it seems that the system doesn't allow me to do it. Uh, right. Um, it seems that I may have to exit and enter again uh, for the system to allow me to um, uh, share the screen. I uh, hope that is okay if I, if I disappear for a second and then come back. Sure, Professor, no problem. Great. So uh, I'll see you in a, in, in a few seconds.
Right, I'm back. Uh, apologies for that, and hopefully now you can all see the presentation. Um, yes, sir, we can see. Great. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the nice um, introduction. Um, I'll set that on the screen so you can see the next one. Um, so my plan for today would be to um, I'll look at starting with a why uh, as a way of approaching paper writing, then move into developing a publication strategy. Um, we'll talk a bit about how do you write your paper like a story and the benefits that has uh, and why you should start with uh, writing the abstract first rather than last as others would advise and, and, and share some of the key takeaways. Um, um, so, very briefly, my story, although it has been already shared, um, I've, um, I've I've been there, and, and I would say I have done nearly every mistake that an early career has to be made. <laughs> um, but thankfully, I have learned very quickly from my mistakes, and I had some really good mentors that helped me to move fairly quickly um, uh, through the academic career ladder. And, and in return, now I'm just sharing. Um, the lessons I've learned and how you can do more with less. And that's the main lesson in, in my academic life is how to be very strategic, very purposeful with what you do and achieve more with less. And in fact, if you were to look at my uh, journal and my general publications, you'll see that for a professor, my publications is not an amazing number, but it's of high quality and that has enabled me um, to progress very quickly. Um, so why starting with a why? Um, so the first thing I would say is before you even consider writing a paper, you should think, what is the purpose? Why am I writing this paper? What am I trying to achieve? Uh, your, your why is really your compass that helps you select the type of paper the publisher, who you want to collaborate to co-author with. And this approach will save a lot of time and effort. Um, so main reason generally for writing a paper is either getting a job or a promotion um, as a way of to develop new collaborations with other researchers or other researchers in the future and may help you to secure a job. Uh, work in their lab. Um, if you are probably at mid stage of your career, um, papers help you recruit PhD students. I get a lot of PhD students because they read my papers, books, and they say, I'm interested in this work. I, I, I want uh, to do PhD with you. Um, to help you develop your research area, maybe you identified, I want to become an expert in this research area, and therefore, I need publications that help me create a track record. Another very important um, is to write papers that will help you um, provide a track record for research grants. So for example, I want to now write a research grant to get some funding to do more research, but it's in an area where I don't have many publications. So my focus uh, this year has been to develop publications in this area. So when I apply for funding, I can point to those as a way of demonstrating that you know I have experience in this area. And the other thing is to generate either academic or even non-academic impact. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, I've been very fortunate that some of my research has been featured by the media. And again, this is something that helps with securing jobs, PhDs, promotions, and, and generally collaborating with other researchers. Um, I should say that the slides, I'm going to make them available to the organizers of the conference so they can forward them to you and you can have a copy. And I've built in questions to the presentation, so I'll be posing at some points and opening the floor for, uh, to, for questions. The second thing is, once you identify you know, why you want to write a paper, then you've um, 
should start thinking about developing your publication strategy. Publication strategies is a plan basically where it helps you define what is your research area because to to go somewhere, I guess, in an academic career, whether it is a PhD or a postdoc or an assistant professorship, or later on down the road to full professorship, you need to demonstrate expertise in a specific area. So it's good to say, you know, this is the area that I want to focus or I'm interested in. And then you work to map a plan for the next three or five years. 10 years is maybe a bit too long, but certainly for the next three years, you can start with a thinking, right, what papers do I want to write in relation to the uh, research areas that I identified and to my goals? Um, and this do not necessarily have to be just journal papers. It could be um, conference papers. It could be review papers, which are very important. And, an easy way, easier way comparatively for early career researchers um, to start with. Um, and then um, also when you develop your publication strategy, so you know that within the next three years, you want to publish X number of papers in, in some areas, you start thinking, right, to help me publish in this area, it would be a lot easier to collaborate with another researcher. Maybe there's someone who's doing similar research uh, or someone I would want in any case to collaborate with and writing a paper with someone with that person would be a great way to develop trust and build a relationship. Um, so as part of your publication strategy, you think not only when and where were you going to publish, but also what type of publications you're going to do and who, very importantly, you're going to work with. Um, when you receive the slides, I have some links in there and um, uh, you can click to, to those. The, the first one is a link to a, a newsletter article I wrote that goes in very much detail through this five step process. Uh, and the other one is access to a template I've created, uh, which you can download that has an Excel spreadsheet that I use personally for my publication strategy and you can use it to create your publication strategy and it has a number uh, of examples. Um, um, so basically the publication strategy uh, template looks a bit like that uh, where you've got um, a number of columns and you add then uh, um, your papers for instance who you want to work with and, and and then it combines everything together in a in a coherent um, way it's a it's a, a great way of, um, of, of working um, so it's something to definitely check out when you get a copy of the uh, slides uh, I have to say, application strategy is what has made a massive difference in my professional career, but also in other early career researchers I work with, because it helps to focus. When you're very focused on what you do, you've, you're more proactive rather than reactive. It helps you to go through tasks that you know they're going to help you to achieve what you want to, rather than just looking around at what may be the opportunities. Uh, and this is something I learned from my own mentor um, and has been truly invaluable. So, as I said, I want rather than to give a very long presentation to do it in small bits. So I'm going to pause now for a minute and open the floor to answer any questions you have. Um, and then I will continue with um, different covering different aspects of the presentation. But so far, just to summarize, um, the key message I would say is start with your why. Think and write down preferably why you, you want to publish a paper, what it will help you do. Then um, take this why 
use my template if you want to, or your own template, there may be others online to create your own publication strategy. So you, you know within the next year, or ideally within the next three years, this is where you're going to publish, this is the topics you're going to cover, and these are the people you want to work with. Um, so I will open the floor um, to any questions you may have, and you can of course post some questions on the chat as well, I'll be looking at that as well too. Thank you so much for insightful and uh, enriching session we had today. Uh, I hope you all found Professor Emmanuel Sector's presentation on publication strategies as informative and valuable as I did. Let's take a moment to extend our heartfelt gratitude, to Professor, for sharing his expertise with us. So now let's open the floor for a brief question and answer session. I encourage all attendees to take advantage of this opportunity to further delve into the topics covered today. Please feel free to type your question into the chat box and I'll also raise your hand. We'll address them on one by one. Please yeah, don't as I said, this is just a, Sorry, this is just the first part of my presentation. So there's yeah, please. Come. Yeah, your curiosity. Yes, please. If anyone have a question, you can raise the hand. It's the first part of this webinar. I think Atta has raised. His hands. Uh, yes, Atta. Yes, Atta. Mm -hmm. I think you're muted, Atta, because we cannot hear you. Atta Rehman, yes, you can ask your question. Uh, hello, Assalamu Alaikum. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My question is that how can we start with the abstract? Uh, can you elaborate that, uh, that most difficult part of the paper is abstract? So how can we start abstract? Thanks, Atta. That's Thanks, an Atta. excellent point. And it's very true. It's, it's, it's a difficult part. But it's the most important part of the paper. If you don't mind, this is, this is covered later in my presentation. So... Um, I'll cover that in, in, in a few minutes, so if you don't mind waiting and, until I talk about that, and then if there's uh, more questions you can ask. I'm going to show you through a specific approach I use um, to structure the template and provide you access to some resources with some examples. Um, I can see we've got some questions also in the chat. Um, uh, there's yes, one sir. from... Muhammad uh, Iyad. Hazan? Muhammad Ayaz is asking about how we can find which journal is real or SCA index journal and which journal is scam. Uh, Muhammad, your, your question is very timely because only yesterday I posted on LinkedIn. So do follow me on, on, on LinkedIn. Um, I, I, I posted um, some resources, free resources, some websites uh, where you can check um, um, about um, the journal ranking and um, I'll be also posting uh, next week more about some uh, predatory channels but actually I'm going to put you on the chat here uh, some resources I recommend so for journal ranking I will use those resources uh, the schema goes the scopus uh, and so on. These are all free. You can just access them. You can just type the name of the journal you want to publish and it tells you how its quality, whether it's quarterly one, two, three, four. And the second list with the predatory journals, this has been created by organizations where they give you a list of the journals that, you know, they're not genuine, they're predatory. They're there just to make money and you should avoid. Um, so there's two websites, the bills list and the predatory reports that have a list that they regularly update. And then there is some great resources, the Think, Check and Submit, that basically gives you a step-by-step -step guide that you should follow to check whether this journal is authentic or not. And the last one is a database of the open journals that shows you which journals um, uh, are, are open and you know they have ethical practices. 
I hope that answer your, answers your question. Thank you, sir. Sorry if you have a, one more question. Monim Farzan. Uh, yeah. He asked about how should we look for the publishers to publish our articles? Yes, great. And, and that relates very much. I kind of given half of that answer already. So what I do is, for instance, in, for some of my areas, I already know because I've published before, which are the main publishers, but maybe I want to publish in a different area where I'm not aware. So what I would do is I will go to this list that I've just copied and pasted on the chat with the journal rankings. For instance, I use quite often this Kimango. I, I, um, and there you can type uh, not just the journal, also you can type the area you're interested in, say public health or management studies or um, you know, um, mechanical engineering. And it would give you a list of you know um, the journals ranked uh, according to different criteria they have so i use that and this kind of tells me right that these are journals first of all that they're genuine and then journals that they are top ranked um really good ranked mid ranked and probably ones which are low ranked i don't always go for the top ranked uh, because as i said it depends on, on what i want to achieve if I want to have a publication fairly quick in order to help me apply for a grant, I may go for a second quartile rather than a first quartile. If I want something to establish my niche, I maybe go for some on the on the top uh, on the top list. So I hope that does answer your question as well. Okay, thank you. One more question from Salman Khan. Uh, he's asked how we will choose our research topic relevant to modern progression and how we will narrow it. Yes, very good question. There's two things usually I, I would advise about selecting your topic. First of all is one that aligns to your interest and your studies. And the other one is aligns to where there would be funding. Um, so in the past, when I was an early career researcher, I did a mistake. Um, I focused in a very narrow area, which was interesting of, for me at the time. It was relevant to my PhD, but it was an area where uh, there wasn't that much funding. So learning from my mistake, I changed the area and I focused in another area now. I focus in health, where I know there's always funding because unfortunately it's, it's an area where there's always people that they are unhealthy and governments um, internationally, they, they provided funding. Uh, sustainability, net zero are areas that currently have a lot of funding. Um, so it's a combination between what you're interested in and whether there is research interest and and, and funding because that helps you progress as a as an academic research a researcher. Thank you, sir. We have a one more question from Hasnan Sajjad. How can we publish review article in original journal? Um, um, review paper is very different from an original research journal. So, um, sorry, from a, a research paper. A research paper is about a specific study you did with some new findings that contribute to the science, whereas a review paper is more about comparing what others have published before. And by, by, by studying what others have done, you've, you then provide some recommendations, some meta-analysis that is useful for whoever is reading that review paper to understand the field what has been done, what are some of the challenges, and what are some of the open research areas. Um, most of um, journals, including the top ranking journals, when you go into the website and you look for author information, they will tell you what, what type of journals they publish. 80% of them, they actually publish review papers. But I would go there and check, do they, do they publish? review papers. If not, or if you if they don't say, if you're not sure, you can always send an email to the editor to ask, do you publish research papers? And that will tell you. Um, 
the, any more? I, I think there is one more question from yes. Mohammed Ayaz. Yes. If we start to write a review paper, what are the basic steps? There is a lot. It's um, probably a whole new session on that. I'll give you a brief outline. You start with the research question. So the research question is what you want to explore, examine. Uh, so for instance, let's say I want to um, explore um, I use health because it's, it's, it's my area, one of my areas of expertise. I want to explore the impact of different uh, intervention on people living with diabetes. Yeah. Um, once I have my research question, that kind of gives me the keywords. So I select the keywords and I select the databases that I'm going to look for searching for journals and conference papers. Uh, and then you set some inclusion and exclusion criteria. So what are you considering? So examples could be, I'm looking only for papers that have been published in the past 10 years. I'm looking for papers mainly published in English. I'm looking either for journal or conference papers. I'm not interested in reports or position papers. Um, and then you've basically use those online databases which you have selected, put in those keywords, and then it's a, it's a specific process you follow um, by reading first the title, then the abstract, to um, decide whether this paper worth including in the review. And in the end, you end up with a list of anywhere between 10 to 30 papers that they fit your research question, your selection criteria, and then you analyze them. Um, and, and then you've developed your um, your analysis and discussion. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Emmanuel Sekler, for your enlightening responses. Uh, can we move to a forward to our webinar? Sure. Um, so sure. let's move to the um, the next part of the presentation, the second one. Um, Something I learned fairly late in my career, but it has been very transformative, is, is the way you, you write. And to be honest with you, whether you're writing a research paper, whether you're writing your PhD thesis, whether you're writing a research grant, you actually are telling a story. Uh, why is story? Stories is if you think back to your childhood or if you have any children or nephews or nieces, stories is how we learn. This is how we first learn about the world around us. There is something within our brain that processes information and retains information when they talk about stories. Um, so it's a great metaphor to use when you're writing, as I said, any type of academic writing, and in this case, focus on the paper. Um, and if you think of a story or a film, you know, films are basically perfect examples of story. If someone asks you about a film, what's the first thing they're going to ask you is, have you, did you watch this movie? Um, what was this movie about? And what they're looking is, you know, you, they're looking for a very, very brief statement where you talk about the theme of the movie. Oh, this is a movie. I haven't watched the movie, I have to admit now, for a long time. Um, and, um, um, I, I try to think of an example of a popular movie that most people have watched. Um, uh, but basically, let's take, I don't know, any, any ideas on, on the chat for any movies that I can give you an example? Let's make it interactive. Any suggestions for movies? Any movie anyone has recently seen? Okay, I'll select an, an, an old, uh, yeah, Titanic. Okay, Titanic. So hopefully uh, a lot of people have seen the Titanic. So if someone asks you what the Titanic is about, you don't give them the whole story. You just say, "Oh, it's yeah. about the personal story of um, uh, romance developed on the boat making his maiden voyage uh, from the UK to the US that um, shipwrecked and tells the various stories of key characters uh, with a sad ending." Um, 
So that's the theme of the movie. Um, it's, it's the main gist, if you like. And this is where you start with your paper. You want to be able to explain very simply, like you do with the movie, what is the theme of your paper? What is it about when someone asks you in a very plain language, very simple. Also, a great way of just not explaining the theme of your paper is also structuring it. Now, if you think of any film or any story, it has the following six ingredients. It has an opener, so it starts with something that has happened. It has a villain, you know, the bad guy. It has a hero, you know, the one that stands up against the bad guy trying to do something. Then there is a climax, you know, there is, there is an interaction, there's a fight between the villain and the hero, and something happens. Then there is the resolution, which is what has happened, that resolves the issue, the hero overcomes all the troubles, uh, beats the villain and, and the bad plans and saves the day and then there's an ending you know there's usually the moral of the story what do we learn what do we take forward it's the same with movies now you may ask okay that's that's about the story but how does it relate to paper well it does because if you looked at the key ingredients of a paper the key headings that we use in 90% of the research papers, you have an introduction, well, that's the opener, you set the context. You've got a problem, you, you talk about a specific challenge you try to address by research, that's your villain, that's the bad guy. You talk about your methodology that you follow to try to resolve that, that's your hero. You know how that methodology will help resolve that issue. Then you talk about the findings, you know, that's the climax of the story. That's, that's where the action happens. And then the resolution, you know, that's your discussion. That's, that brings the story to a close, resolving the challenge. And then of course, you've got the conclusion, the ending, which you tie up loose ends and brings everything to a close. And you talk about the impact of the research and what other researchers should be doing. Um, and I've, I have here a link to the graphic I have with one of my LinkedIn posts where I explain in more detail uh, this process of writing your paper um, like a story. Um, uh, it's amazing how simple in, it is in hindsight. Actually, it took me quite a while to figure this out. And since then, it has helped me publish papers it has dramatically reduced um, rejection because it means I can capture the reviewers right from the start. It makes it more clear for them what my paper, what my research is about. It's sold in a more interesting way, making, making it less boring. And also I can use that to explain it to other non-academic audience about, you know, what my paper is about, like you've talked about what the movie is about. And where it has been done amazing impact is actually in writing grants, writing research bids. When I tell them like a story, it increases my chances of getting the funding. And I recommend now my PhD students to use this process for writing their PhD because your PhD thesis is, is really a story. Um, so I'm going to take another break here um, because I'm pretty sure there will be questions about a specific aspect before we go to the next part and talk about abstracts. Um, so I'll open again the floor uh, to any questions about writing your paper as a story. Again, you can use the chat if you want to um, pose your questions. If anyone have a question, please raise your hand or you can also use the chat box to give your question. If a anyone has practice. something on your mind, yes, please. Uh, just to add that a good practice to think <coughs> about the theme of your paper and how to write a thing is, is to think about a movie you recently watched 
and saying, can I summarize briefly the movie? Then how do I use this technique for my paper? Uh, I think we had the hand up. Uh, but it was too quick, I didn't see who it was from. Okay, maybe there's no questions for these sections. Ah, yeah, there is. Uh, yes, we have a one question from Mohammed Ayaz. Yeah. Please provide any links or website where we can download free paid research papers rather than Sci-Hub. Um, what I would do, Mohammed, is I would look for open access papers. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, and this is a fairly new thing. Uh, all publishers now, including the ones that where you subscribe, for some of the journals that have some of the papers in open access. Nowadays, when you conduct research, especially in the UK, uh, most European countries, you're obliged, if you received funding from a public body like the government or research institution, to make any publications you do available for free. So it doesn't sit behind the paywall, you don't need to subscribe to it. This is called open access and open access papers. Um, so um, if you search for open access uh, papers, um, you'll be able to see the, the ones um, within the journal you're interested in that they're free. Also the website I shared at the past, the database of journal papers, uh, I'll share it again, has a list of journals um, that um, have this open access. But as I said, even some of the journals that are subscription based, they will have a lot of papers open access and now more and more paper, more journals they're trying to do that because they see that this is the way forward uh, there's a question from sajid uh, to tell the difference between writing the introduction and the problem yes a very good question is often very much related the introduction is where you give a very brief overview you very briefly state the problem and the area. Um, for instance, you'll say um, there is um, X amount of people that living with diabetes. One of the challenges they face with diabetes is to monitor the glucose level uh, in this uh, research, which was funded by this project. We explored how um we can help people to monitor the glucose levels in a non-invasive way so you see you you give a bit um you give a bit more than just the problem you 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 say very brief what the problem is whereas in the problem section um you go into more detail you know you give more statistics and exactly what the problem is you talk about what other researchers have done why it hasn't worked or what has worked and where is the research gap? What needs to be done next? Um, there is a, a hand um, raised by Amir. Amir, you've got the floor. Amir, is the question you want to ask? Please unmute your mic and ask the question, please. Maybe it was by accident. Um, I'll move to the next question then in the chat, um, which is how we can find problems in a research paper. Um, usually these are found in the introduction I'm sorry, in the abstract, they may say this is the problem area where um, this paper is investigating uh, in the related work. Um, and of course, in the conclusion, they usually summarize and again, they say this research paper has addressed this problem by doing X, Y, Z. Um, so look first at the abstract, then the related work or background, uh, and then the conclusion. 
Uh, how much works? We write the introduction section. That depends, uh, Salman, on the specific journal you write because each one has different um, instructions. I usually keep the introduction short. It's like the opening of a movie. You know, you just want to get them enticed, but you don't give everything. Um, so I use that analogy. The introduction should be the second shortest um, section in your paper. The, the shortest section is the conclusion and then uh, the, the next shortest um, section should be your introduction. Um, Fazal Dan, another question, how can we find, oh yeah, I, I've already responded to that. Um, okay, so there's a question from Muhammad about funding sources. Um, how do you find funding for uh, publishing? Um, usually the best way to get funding for your papers is being affiliated with a research institution so that generally they would provide funding for that because it is in their interest to have publications under the name of that institution because it helped them with the ranking as an individual to be honest with you um i'm, I'm not aware maybe resources but um it's not ones that um, i'm aware of um so we move to the next section section unless yes please uh, okay yes, please, the last yeah. question uh from mohammed when we study research paper how do we find the research gap in this research this is when you look to review papers uh, is, is a great way uh, because they will tell you some research gaps in, in this area. Uh, if you look within a research paper, the research gap it should usually be mentioned at the discussion section and then reiterated at the conclusion. So they'll say, for instance, that because um, um, the discussion section, you analyze the findings which you've presented in the results section and you compare them with the literature. So you say, um, this intervention that we've tested uh, performed well, performed better than what others have found in these papers. However, um, there's still need for more research in this area. So in that way, um, you know, that tells you what is the research gap. And usually in the conclusion, they will say, that's uh, a call to action that we will need more research in this area or next we're going to look into this field. So that provides you hints. Um, Ahmad, do you have a question ab about to ask? Wakar, you have a question, please ask. Unmute your mic and then ask your question. Uh, maybe it was by accident, so yeah. I'm going to move to the, the next section. Yes, please. Yes, please so. Right, the abstracts, and you know, I already received a question about that. So, I used to I used to be part of the school that would say the abstract should be the last thing you write in your in your paper and everyone would say that because you know you need to write your paper first then to understand how to summarize it and until probably three three four years ago this is the approach i used until i discovered this method before i go into the method let me explain why it's important to start with your abstract um like any story again using the same analogy the abstract is the first part um, that anyone will read. Let's take the example of the reviewer, right? When you submit a paper, the reviewer is going to read, sorry, even before that, the editor, when you submit a paper, is the editor that looks at your title and abstract. And based on those, they don't read the full paper. 
they decide who they should review it, who they, who they should select as a reviewer. So if you spend effort and you have a clear abstract, you're more likely to be sent to a reviewer relevant to your work, who is more likely to appreciate it. Uh, I've seen it many times in my experience as well, where my paper was assigned to a reviewer who's not in my field and didn't quite understand the work. Or even as a reviewer myself, I have received papers that were not in my field and I was wondering, why did they forward this to me? It's not related to my expertise. Then the reviewer, again, the abstract is the very first thing they read. And we are all humans. Uh, like when you meet someone, where we, we tend to form impressions very quickly. You know, you meet someone and within the first few seconds you realize you implicitly know whether you like them or not. Then of course you need more time to provide a rationale for it, but, you, but first impressions count. And the same is for, um, for papers. The abstract is the first part of your writing, of your work, the reviewer is going to see. If they like it, the more likely then to approach at reading the rest of your paper in, in a positive mind frame. So if they don't, if it's not written that well, if it's complex, they cannot understand what your work is about, then likely, most likely to say, mm, I'm not sure about this paper. And then they read it more in a negative mindset, trying to find ways to reject it. So abstract is important. But then even after your paper is published, your readers, so other researchers, um, what they read first is your title and then the abstract. And that's when they make decisions. Should I read more of the paper? Should I download it? Should I use it for my PhD? Should I use it for my research? Should I include it in the review paper? So the abstract for me is, is the most important, is where a lot of the effort should go. And having it in a structured way helps you not only win first impressions, but it helps you set up the whole paper. And that is important you do it at the start. So I have here an example of the method I developed. I call it the SCARIC. Um, and it stands for Situation, Challenge, Action, Result, Impact, Call to Action. So the acronym uh, SCARIC. Um, and basically, um, you start by describing the situation, so this is the context, and I have here an example from a, published, uh, from a paper I published recently. Then you state the challenge, so this is the situation, the whole problem, this is a specific problem that my paper looks at, then the action taken, so this is more of your methodology. Um, we use this method in order to investigate it. Then you very briefly present some of the key highlights of your results. Then you discuss the impact. Why is important what you found? You know, this is the first study to explore this. So this is the first study to, um, to, to share with such findings. And then it's a bonus if you have a call to action, uh, which is more about, okay, what people should be doing next. Um, you know, so for instance, in my paper, I say there's an urgent need for targeting intervention at the household level. We need more research in this area. Um, we need to do this, we need to do that. Um, and in fact, if you look again at the SCARIC method, it resembles very much the way of a story is told. The situation is the introduction, the challenge is the villain, the action is the hero. The result is the climax, the impact is the resolution and the call to action is the ending. So in fact, I first write the abstract. I may edit it, of course, afterwards when I've written the whole paper, but I first start with that. And then I reuse elements from that to structure my whole paper. So I take what I've written for the situation and I expand it to help me write the introduction of the paper. I take what I've written for the challenge and I expand those points for my background and related work area. I take what I've written for the actions and this forms my methodology where of course I add more details. I take some of my key findings and I explore them within my findings section. Uh, what I've highlighted as impacts, 
these are the key um, points in my finding section and of course my conclusion relates to my call to action. Also another important thing about going for the abstract first rather than last is when you write papers with others, you're co-authoring papers and you're leading you need some common language, you know, if you ask people to write different sections, they need to know, okay, what is the whole plot? Again, to use a story analogy, if you just tell them, oh, write, the write this section, write that section, they need to know what is the main story you're trying to say, the main elements. So if you have already written the abstract, you can give it to them and say, right, guys, this is what we're aiming for. Can you focus on this section? Can you focus on that? Um, so it's not just for... Um, gaining good first impressions. It's not just um, about gaining visibility from other researchers. It's also about structuring your paper. It's also about communicating with other authors. The reason is important, to, I found very useful to use this format, is because when my abstract matches very well the um, paper, format and in fact it reuses some key expressions and key highlights the people who are reviewing it who are reading it they find it very consistent they say it's very clear i can see exactly what you're saying and um, i can tell right from the abstract what the paper is about so again um if you want to find more information about this i've written a whole newsletter article which is free to use when you receive the slides, you'll be able to access it by clicking on the link that gives you more details about this method. I've also created a guide and a template um, that you can download that has this method. It also takes one of my papers and gives you examples of how I use this method to write the abstract and then to write um, the, the whole paper. Um, but basically, this has been for me the best, uh, one of the most effective tools, starting first with the Amstrad, has transformed my writing. Um, and um, I hope it does for you too. Now, before um, finishing the presentation, uh, one of the key highlight I want to offer to you and a call to action is think about what is the best way to learn. Uh, there is a famous quote uh, that says that smart people learn from their mistakes, however wise people learn from the other people's mistakes. So how do you translate that within the context of paper writing? Well, you, know, you learn from your own mistakes when you write papers, you submit them, you get feedback from the reviewers, you learn. But if you want to speed up that learning, you become a reviewer because that way you learn not only from your own mistakes, but you learn from the mistakes of others. As a reviewer, I have learned what not to do. Um, and I don't have to wait only for when I, I publish papers uh, or submit papers. I, I can see when I'm reviewing mistakes people are doing, but also good approaches. What good approaches others are using that I can adapt and apply to my own writing. Um, also, it helped me think about, okay, how do reviewers review papers? How long, how much time they have? How do they fit through their very busy um, work life? Where do they start? How much time do they actually spend reviewing? And what you'll find, actually to find that you need to review papers yourself. But what I find is, reviews do not spend that much time as as I thought reviewing papers. Um, therefore, again, that's why an abstract and a very clear structure is very important. Actually, being a reviewer is what has helped me develop those strategies that I'm sharing with you today. So my call to action for you for today is as soon as we finish this workshop, go online, search for journals that are accepting reviewers. Some may have an application which you can fill for others that you're interested there in your research area, write to the editor and ask, how can I become a reviewer? They're always asking and looking for reviewers. And you can do the same also for conference papers as well. That's 
one of the greatest way to fast track your learning. Um, and before I open the, um, the Q&A, just to say that um, I'm developing a, a writing course um, that will expand uh, on what I've talked here today and it will have a lot more information going step by step uh, with templates, with guides and examples on, you know, from where do you look for papers, how do you write papers, how do you respond to um, comments from reviewers? How do you format your papers to address um, the requirements uh, from others? And it will include uh, video tutorials with access for lifetime, being part of the communities, templates, and everything. Um, and again, when you receive these, um, as I said, it's not ready yet. It will be in several months, but you can register um, your expression for free. Uh, and those actually who would join the waiting list, they will get a, a significant discount once the program is ready. Um, I've got at the end also um, different resources. Um, you can contact me, my free newsletter, you can follow me on different social media and I post there a lot of tips as well. Um, but these are the, the main uh, points I wanted to share with you um, and again uh, for third and the last time I'm going to open uh, the floor to um, any questions uh, we have for today. Thank you so much sir. Dear participants we're excited to hear your questions if you have something on your mind simply raise your hand and we'll give you the floor to speak directly with our speaker. Uh, there's a question about my contact information. Uh, this is already on the slides at the end, so when you receive the slides, you'll have all my contact information there. Uh, what qualifications are required to review papers? Well, very good question. These will be usually specified by the journals. In most cases, they would require someone um, that may have a PhD, if you're going for the high, you know, the, the top ranked um, journals, but you don't have to for a reviewer. Um, they would usually require someone that has at least got a master's and they have research in a specific area. It varies depending on the journals. It's more easier for conferences, I have to say, um, but both are invaluable. If there is any other question, please ask your question. Yes, Akhtabaz. What is the standard template of writing a research paper? Um, the standard one is abstract, introduction, related work, a methodology, find the results, discussion and conclusion. Um, though, there, however, before writing a paper, I would first look at the journal I want to submit, if you are submitting for the journal, to ensure that this is the format I have, because some journals are very prescriptive and tell you that for this journal, you should follow this format. Um, so I will definitely check what they have. Uh, Salman Khan has raised his hand. Salman, do you have a question to ask? Is there anyone who asked the question? Please raise your hand and unmute your mic and ask the question, please. Maybe it was by accident. Uh, yeah. In most of the research paper, the findings of the research is written in the last part of the paragraph. Then a uh, technique is free to write it in abstract also. And what are the main differences between the last part of the paragraph and in abstract? 
Sorry, the connection was really bad, so I didn't really hear that. I don't know, um, Saida, if you heard that question and you can repeat it. Dear participant, your voice is not clear. Can you please give your question yeah. on the chat box? Yeah, yeah, that, that would work. Uh, in Thank the meantime, you. I'm going to address another question. Uh, how much time is required to review to write a review article from Marium? Uh, Marium, it, it, it depends on how big is your research question and how many papers there are in this area. Usually, review papers they're written by at least two people, and this is because of the methodology. With you need at least another pair of eyes to check uh, when you select the criteria for to ensure transparency and objectivity. So I, I would never write a review paper on my own. I would always cooperate it with at least another person. Um, I would say that to write a, a good review paper, if you've done it before, probably you need um, three months, two to three months. If you haven't done it before, it could take as much as six months because you're learning of the process as well. Uh, Hassan, you've got a question, you raise your hand. Yes, Hassan Arif, can you unmute yourself and ask the question, please? Hassan, can you hear me? Um, I have uh, questions regarding research proposal for masters. Yes. Um, uh, my professor gave me 40 research paper to read by um, next week and I have to write a research proposals uh, after reading that papers and uh, it could be of uh, 20 pages but uh, as uh, i recently uh, i am recently graduated from the university so i don't know how to read and understand these research papers and uh, uh, write the full length proposals so how how i can cover these research papers in 20, uh, in one week yeah i mean i'm sorry to hear that the your supervisor, whoever that was, they shouldn't have just given you a week. It's very cruel to give a week for 40 papers. I wouldn't do that. But um, the way it could help you is generally the way I recommend uh, people should read papers. And that is you start with a research question or you know what you're interested in finding out. Again, what is the purpose of reading the research papers? Uh, and then you first start at the title. You don't read the whole paper. You've got the title and you make an assessment. Is this interesting? Is this related to what I, you know, to what I want to write? If the answer is yes, you move and read the abstract. Um, if the abstract is relevant and interesting, then and only then you move, not to the, not to the intro to read the paper, but you move to the conclusion. You go all the way to the end and see, okay, what they conclude which is usually a brief summary of the paper and the findings, is it relevant to what I want to do? And usually the conclusion is, is the key highlights of the paper that kind of summarizes uh, the whole paper. So you can use that um, within, you know, the reports uh, that, you, that you want to write. And then and only then I would actually read the whole paper if reading the um, uh, title, abstract conclusion, I feel, you know, this is important. Um, Mohammed had a similar a re related question. Um, so, you know, Mo yeah, Mohammed, about uh, what part of the paper we should study that help in you know, a paper writing. I would say all, they, all sections, if you're first starting, they're important because you have to write them all. But as I said before, I would definitely study abstracts. Uh, first, because that's the first part of the paper that anyone is encountering. Um, 
Then Muhammad Sakil Khan had another question. If a paper is rejected, what's the best way to, to submit it? To resubmit it? Uh, it depends how it's rejected. Sometimes you may, uh, or if it's fully rejected, because sometimes it may be accepted with revisions, I take the feedback. Um, and sometimes the editor will say, go back, uh, address the feedback, and then you can resubmit. Or if they don't say that, then I would identify another journal to do that. However, sometimes it's important to understand why the paper is rejected. So for instance, uh, even if you're very experienced at my level, sometimes you get rejected and the reason is not the quality of your paper, is actually that the, the journal you're targeting is not related to your field. So a year ago, I had a, a, a paper re rejected from where I submitted it. And the editor didn't even send it to reviewers. They just told me that your paper is not relevant to the journal. So, and they recommended somewhere else, submitted it, and I submitted it, and it was uh, accepted. So sometimes it's because you haven't selected the right uh, journal or your paper, it doesn't fit the remit of the paper. Uh, but if you've got to review your feedback, then I take this on board and use them to submit elsewhere. Um, so we've got a question from Salman that I couldn't hear before. Um, in most of the research papers, the findings of the research written is the last part of the introduction. Then it is necessary to write out findings in the ASA section also. And what is the difference between the last part of the introduction and abstract? Um, no, in the introduction, you shouldn't necessarily have the findings. Um, introduction you may just have some key highlights. Um, but I generally do not have the findings in the introduction. And the introduction, I just um, talk about the importance of the area I'm investigating, why it is, and maybe give some context about the, pro the research. So for instance, if it is part of a bigger project or the different uh, partners involved, talk about, you know, about these. Uh, I will definitely have some highlights of the findings, therefore, in the abstract, but not necessarily in the introduction. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Okay. Thank you so much, dear Professor Emmanuel Sekas. I want to take a moment to ex express my heartfelt appreciation for your invaluable insights you shared in this webinar on writing the research papers in abstract. Your expertise and practical strategies have undoubtedly inspired our audience to take their scholarly endeavors to new heights. I'm honored to have the opportunity to host you as our esteemed guest, and I'm certain that your contribution have enriched our understanding of academic excellence. It is wonderful to have such a knowledgeable, inspiring figure as part of our academic community. To all our participants, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude for joining us today. I hope you found this webinar informative insight and that has given you the motivation to continue pursuing your research goals with renewed vigor and thoughts. As we conclude this webinar, let's take a moment to reflect on the knowledge and wisdom that has been shared here today. And I'm confident that with the right mindset and approach, each and every one of us can achieve a great things in our academic version. Thank you again, Professor Seclis, for your kindness, generosity, and expertise. We are truly honored to have you as a part of our academic community, and we look forward to many more opportunities to learn from your wisdom and experiences. With warm regards and best wishes for continued success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Seda, and thanks everyone for the very thoughtful and really good questions. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to talk and, and share what, what I've learned from my own experience and others that I mentor. And, and just to let you know that you know, um, you can definitely do it. It's just a matter of being strategic, purposeful with what you do. Uh, and as I said, learn not just from your own mistakes, but learn from the mistakes of others. So if you can, my call to action for you today is once we finish this, try to find the journal conference paper, join the review committee. Um, uh, once you do that, you'll, you'll see the difference. Uh, it will make it so much. Thanks again. Connor. Feel free to connect via social media. And um, I wish uh, every single one of you all the best in your um, academic careers and beyond. 
take care and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye from Thank you. Uh, England. Take care. Bye. Bye.